Hello and welcome to Controversy. My name is Alex Walsh and on this special programme we will be discussing the political fuss behind the Winter Olympic Games in Sochi. From toothpaste tube terror threats to allegations of corruption, gay rights protests, everything but the sport has been hitting the news. Is this a simple case of Russia bashing? Is it the Cold War revisited? Are Obama and company right to want to boycott the Olympics over gay rights? Well, there's plenty to discuss, and we have three very special guests with us today to do just that. They are Tara McCormack. Tara is lecturer in international politics at the University of Leicester, with a particular interest in post-Cold War foreign and security policies. We also have David Forrest. David is a former GB international swimmer and doctor of anthropology, specialising in gender and sexual relations in so-called socialist nations. He has also taken part in the Gay Games and is now a landscape architect. And last but not least is our very own Niall Crowley. Niall is volunteer coordinator here at World Bites. He studied design history and worked for many years as a freelance designer. His career has included stints at BBC Worldwide and News International as a freelance writer, East End pub landlord and restaurateur. Before hearing from our guests, we're going to take a quick look at what's been making the news on Sochi. target for kind of Western moral grandstanding, particularly after the end of the Cold War. However, I think even by those standards, what we see today in terms of the campaign around the Sochi Olympics has been uh, notable by its particular kind of viciousness, uh, I would say ignorance and hypocrisy. And I think what we see is a kind of perfect storm of Western politicians with increasingly uh, little uh, power and authority in their own who have also of late focused on the issue of gay rights, in particular gay marriage has become a real marker for Western uh, politicians to kind of mark out their moral worthiness. We also have internationally the problem of Syria. Russia won't really get on board with the Western agenda so much. Uh, Edward Snowden, for example, um, Russian and American bilateral relations are, are at a particular low ebb. Uh, a lot of things have come together that have led to this kind of particularly angry and, uh, I would say, hypocritical campaign against uh, Russia at the moment in these Olympics. Just thinking back, I do remember um, at the Commonwealth Games in India, there was the similar type of, oh, look, they can't do it, they're a, a poor country, they, they aren't, won't get ready in time, they're bound to fail. Same things are happening into Brazil as well, the same sorts of things. So I think whilst... The point about Russia and the, the gay element, I think, is absolutely pertinent. I think that's what makes it quite different. I think it does stand part and parcel of a general looking down at so-called non-Western nations, nations which are possibly just emerging. I think you've hit the nail on the head in terms of the, the gay element. I think what struck me is the nature of the campaigns and the, in the media and the Twitter campaigns especially has been kind of really trivial what one writer, one gay writer criticising them called slacktivists. This idea that, you know, they get things off their chest and it's more about them sleeping at night, you know, and feeling good about themselves rather than actually being, uh, saying anything of any, any real effect. And, you know, media love is like uh, Stephen Fry and his open letter to David Cameron. I'll just read you what Hugh Laurie wrote. I'd boycott Russian goods if I could think of a single thing they made beside the rest of the world depressed. And there's this constant sneering, you know, just pouring away vodka as a protest. You know, the, the, the absolute sneering and contempt for ordinary Russians as well, I think, is a, is a real problem. I think it's really interesting what you guys are saying, uh, especially you, Niall, about how Twitter has become this platform for, for Russia bashing. One thing that struck me was the pictures that I think a journalist uploaded about the toilet rules, where it says uh, no fishing, and the, uh, the glass uh, with water, which is kind of yellow, has been poured for one of the taps at the hotel. But I wonder how much it is the West being sort of having a laugh on Russia uh, for being backwards, and how much is sort of for Russia for being this old arch enemy 
I'm old enough to recall back in the 70s and 80s when my colleagues were going to the Olympics, etc., there was not the same amount of Russian bashing mm. at all. There was, as far as I can remember, healthy respect for a nation that had achieved an awful lot in sporting achievements, which isn't accorded now. We haven't heard from Russians, and rather we've presented this view of Russia equals Putin, mm. so his views represent everyone, rather than getting an actual kind of local on the ground, what are Russians thinking? There's definitely a disdain for the kind of ordinary Russians. Pre Russians are presented as a kind of, you know, mass of racist, homophobic, uh, brutes, really. So in a way, I'm not so, too surprised that the journalists who are sneering in the hotel rooms aren't really that interested in going out and maybe chatting to ordinary uh, Russians. Russia just provides a very cheap, easy sort of straw man against which the West can posture. Um, you know, and I think we can be, make no mistake, this has nothing to do with gay rights or human rights. You know, of course, we could all list ten of the West's, you know, closest allies, for example, who have far worse uh, human rights records than uh, Russia. You know, and no doubt it's not easy to, be, it's not that great easy to be gay in Russia, but certainly a lot easier to be gay in Russia than, say, Saudi Arabia. It's interesting what you're saying, because in when the Winter Olympics were held in Utah in the U.S. in 2002. We actually had similar laws in place at that time that prohibited the spread of uh, homosexual propaganda, as, as Putin has called this. Not to defend Putin or anything, so I'm, you know, ex-KGB, I'm sure he, <laughs> he's not the most enlightened person in the world, but the law that there's so, so many activists are getting so wound up about doesn't actually mention homosexuals, and, and he did, didn't either. He talks about non-traditional relations or mm. something, which everyone interprets as, uh, as being about homosexuality. But... He was pilloried recently when he was interviewed in the, t uh, in, in the Western press, but I, I, you know, he made a couple of good points. He, he said, I've, I've given awards to homosexuals, you know, I've got people working for, more, for me who are gay. He says, but, you know, I judge them on the basis of them being good at what they do, I'm paraphrasing. And he says, you know, people all, all also said that Tchaikovsky was gay, but we love him for his music. And I, I think that's quite refreshing to say we judge people on, on what they do, not on what they are simply does not seem to me that uh, Russia really merits this campaign. I mean, comparatively, again, as we know, in Britain, if you uh, make a racist or homophobic tweet, you may be uh, arrested. Uh, so really, if we're talking about freedom of speech, you know, I don't think we have that much to uh, be proud of in Britain at the moment. And Putin and his government want to represent Russia as the last bastion for traditional values. And boycotting Russia and trying to send it off into the naughty corner is only bolstering that support. I think it will strengthen those perceptions amongst a small minority of, of Russians who already hold them. I think the same thing is probably going to happen as what's happened in the West in the 80s under Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher who tried to bolster traditional values. It backfired. Society was moving in a more liberal way in any case and I think the same is happening in, in Russia. I think what is Problematic also is the fact that you know when you uh, observe West campaigners like All Out, for example, they really have a lack of faith on Russians themselves to tackle this issue and actually come up with movements like in 1969 in, in Stonewall riots kind of gathered so much support and they were able to you know represent and fight for their rights. I think that this West activists really don't have this faith on the ordinary Russian citizen, which they view as backward. Yeah, I, I agree with that. There's some really interesting writings by Russian activists and, and Russian writers, gay Russian writers, who, you know, many of them are, are saying, we don't need your help and we don't need boycotts. And one writer makes the point that before, he says, we need our own st stonewall, if you like. And before stonewall in America, things are much worse in America than they are in, uh, in, in Russia now, there were far more restrictions on freedom. And he and, uh, and one or two others, uh, you know, cite some really inspiring examples of uh, ordinary Russians. One gay writer, I think his name's Igor Yassin, tells the story how recently he was on a protest, a, a, a pro-gay rights protest in Moscow, and they were outnumbered by anti-gay activists shouting, bigoted slogans and a bunch of teenagers jump in and start 
and start reprimanding them and, they, and the, the bigots uh, go away. You know, there's plenty of other examples. He cites an old man on Facebook remonstrating with a, a, mem a leading member of the Orthodox Church saying, me and my wife have no problem with homosexuals. And there's lots of really good examples of that. David, what's your actual opinion as an ex-gay athlete? Or do you have competed in, if you were kind of in that level, would you have done? Yes, I, th I think, if anything, it's, it's more important to. Um, I remember the fallout from the boycotts of 1980 and 1984, um, the tit-for-tat um, boycotts that were happening in the US and, and the Soviet Union, and how many people um, who'd worked all their lives, um, ironically, to represent their own country. Um, so I, I've often heard the argument, well, athletes are just doing it for themselves, they're being selfish, they're being self-centered, they should be in line with the rest of the world. Well, they're not. They are doing it for themselves, but they're also doing it for their country. A lot of gay people who are competing are doing it also. I can do it. I'm gay. I'm not out yet. I might be out. I'm, who knows? Um, but therefore, I'm still going to make the, the best that I can. The worst we could do is to, prov to disallow people from um, joining in and, and not participating in sport. I think that's the, that would be the worst possible thing. Going on from what you said, David, do you think that gay rights activist groups should be encouraging gay athletes to go, to you know, go for it, try and win gold and prove you know, these Russians wrong? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I recently was at um, a party where um, someone was talking to me, uh, just a normal member of the, um, this group, um, who, who said to me, asked me about this competition called the Gay Games. And they said, all right, is it exclusively for gay people? And I said, no, it's anyone can go, um, but it's generally for uh, gay people. And he said, well, what's to, to stop straight people entering and winning? At which <laughs> point, obviously, we all burst out laughing and say, why would you assume that? So this is the, this is the bigotry from an enlightened country. Mm. By all means, make a statement. If you want to, paint your fingernails, you know, rainbow colours or whatever. But... You know, that's, that's your own individual token statement. It's different from what we're talking about, which is this more concerted attempt to demonise Russia and to take it away from sport and, and put our own agenda onto it. I do think that if we want to really think about what's going on with this kind of campaign of boycott, we, need, we actually don't really need to uh, investigate so much what's going in, on in Russia because I think we need to be clear that this uh, campaign is really not about Russia itself, but it's much more about Western elites uh, finding a kind of easy target, a bit of cheap, uh, and I think ultimately quite dangerous moral uh, grandstanding, and that's where I would argue we need to start when we want to think about this. We want to think, well, what is going on in our societies, in our with our political elites, that leads them to uh, act in this way? And, but I just think in terms of understanding the dynamics behind the campaign, mm. Um, I think we need to be very clear that this is not to do with gay rights in Russia. It actually becomes more of a problem for Russian gay groups and, and minorities when the West starts to, you know, supposedly plough in on their side. One of the most frightening things I found was a couple of weeks back, Maria, Maria Miller, the uh, cult, British Culture Secretary, announced that they were going to start funding gay groups and uh, most notably using Stonewall. In Russia at the moment, gay groups are sort of seen by the Kremlin as the fifth column. And the more interference you get from the West, the, the more isolated the, the, the it's actually going to make them. And, and they must know this, the, 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 the British and Western politicians. So, you know, it's more about their grandstanding and it's being seen to look good. You know, they're more interested in their, their moral standing at home than they are really concerned about what's going on in Russia. It's true, you know, if we think about things that, you know, Peter Tatchell is saying and Jay Leno and Stephen Fry, you know, that uh, Russia's like Nazi Germany. I mean, that's so shockingly historically illiterate and it's something I never say, but, you know, it's actually offensive to say that, which is something I never say, but I mean, it's so shocking and bears so little relationship to reality that I think it really supports the point. It's just nothing to do really with Russia. We see that the West tries to use things to replace the Soviet Union, humanitarian intervention, terrorism, you know, none of those particularly successful. And in that context, Russia's always a good old standby. The particular Sochi campaign, uh, you know, needs to be understood as well in a very 
specific time in terms of Western promotion of gay rights? What I think is really interesting is the way that some of these global brands um, like American Apparel and Google um, and also the, new, the press, the Guardian, uh, the New Statesman, they've all changed their logos. So, you know, yesterday Google Doodle had uh, the rainbow. Well, I think it... For me, that's kind of uh, it's kind of a moral kind of pick and choose, you know. They don't take such stands, uh, moral stands for atrocities that are happening throughout the world. But gay rights has really got this kind of uh, passion. I'm not really sure how to explain it. Well, exactly. it's a colourful flag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it great. I think it, it looks good on Google. Yeah, but it does. Possibly is. But do you, what do you think of that? As bit, obviously, do you think that that's a is it a good thing that they're, they're doing it, or is it a bit you know why that and not something else? I think it's facile. I, I was in um, um, it's a swimming um, session once with my swim team, which is predominantly lesbian gay swim team, and someone was pontificating about how we should boycott the Sochi Olympics and everything. And I did make a point of, well, what about, say, Iraq, the invasion of Iraq? What about untold numerous other atrocities going on? He said, I don't care about that. <laughs> it's about gay. That's where, that's where my interests lie. And I think there is an element of that gay is cool. There's been a few campaigns about voting with your remote, about simply tuning out uh, of watching the Winter Olympics in Sochi. What do you think about campaigns like that that call on citizens to take responsibility for how they're acting? There's also a Dutch singer who wrote an open letter to the Dutch government about the fact that these people are going to Russia and they're going for taxpayer money, and that draws in the citizen in these kind of campaigns. Do you think that that's a relevant question about how we as individuals associate with this and how we need to take responsibility for it more than our politicians. It's not like that's really expressing solidarity with uh, lesbians and gays or oppressed groups in, in Russia. That's more of a kind of typical Western consumerist taxpayer type protest, almost like a degeneration of the uh, set, don't buy South African apples or Israeli apples thing, uh, kind of protest that went on a few years ago, rather than expressing real solidarity with, with ordinary Russians. And you can really see that through uh, the likes of Stephen Fry and, and others calling on um, otherwise discredited politicians. You know, everyone thinks David Cameron's an arse, uh, but when it comes to this, you know, he's suddenly some kind of great saint. And the IOC, I mean, I was looking into uh, the 1968 Black Panther protests and, and the behaviour of the IOC. You know, that, they had those two American athletes kicked out of uh, the Olympics and sent home, and their behaviour was completely disgraceful. I think, I mean, now that the Olympics have actually kicked off, we can see if people are boycotting or not, if they're choosing to watch or not. And Paul Lewis of The Guardian was in Washington, and he visited gay sports bars in the capital to ask them, you know, are you, why are you here watching it, and how do you feel about this? And the vast majority of people he asked, um, they all said, Maybe we feel a little bit guilty, but we're going to watch it. It's important to watch, and it's about the Olympics and the spirit of competing. I think it shows that the majority of people do actually want to watch the Olympics, and while they think it's an important issue, it's not enough to call for a boycott and detract from that. And it's a very vocal minority that have kind of created a frenzy, and we're being led by that. I suppose at the end of the day, it comes down to the idea that the Olympics is a sporting event at the end of the day. So should politics really, like, run the roost? You know, should it determine everything? You know, the majority of Russians, even though the corruption, the amount of money spent on it, they're really excited and they really, you know, they're happy to have it. They haven't had it since the end of the Soviet Union. But the issue that is, uh, for me, is that the IOC continuously picks authoritarian regimes. It, uh, China, Brazil is not authoritarian, but it's got a lot of issues with corruption, with clearing of the favelas. And even in England, the kind of the result of having a built in East London, the kind of the issues of people getting moved out, I just think that by saying that the Olympics is not political, and that's the, the IOC's line as well, I think that that's where the issue really stems from, because it is political, it's used as a political symbol, and the authoritarian regimes that use it do benefit from it. They consolidate their power at home and abroad. It does seem to me that then to t the answer would be, if one really follow that through, well then we can't have it, which would, I think, be, you know, a shame. 
a lot of arguments based around principle six of the Olympics, which mm -hmm. is you can't have discrimination. The Olympics does not go hand in hand with discrimination ever. So the no country is without discrimination. Every country has discrimination. Mm -hmm. So you, at the end of the day, I think you just have to accept and get on with it. Some countries have more discrimination than us. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, where do you draw the line? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's like the similar debates we have around freedom of speech, is when, when is it good to say that's as far as you go? And I think the, the point um, that's just been made by Alex, I think it has to be, um, you have to say, we don't have a society within the, in this uh, global environment that is perfect, that doesn't discriminate, that doesn't do that, whether we discriminate at home or whether we bomb other countries and discriminate there. The point is, we're all in, t in this together. And I think if we start to do that, then we run the risk of backtracking further and further and further until the Olympics becomes nothing but a hollow gesture. Should we be in support of the gay movement in Russia or should we oppose the boycotts and the Russia, uh, Russia bashing? Um, because we saw that in the last few years how a West's moral superiority can be dangerous, um, intervening in other people's wars, locking up people. So what do you all think? Well, I'm certainly against the Russia bashing and absolutely 100% behind groups and minorities who are fighting for their rights, but I think it's... it's upon them to, be, to stand up for their rights and find their feet rather than the likes of Maria Miller, uh, the Culture Secretary and Stonewall um, effectively undermining what they're doing. I wanted to say a point about more broadly about the idea of corruption and there's just complete negativity towards everything about Sochi. I was reading in the Times today, in the Sunday Times, about this thing about overspending just to give you one quote uh, from Roger Boyes in the Times, he says, in a few years' time, Sochi, the legacy of the Putin era, will resemble a Black Sea version of Torremolinos, a destination for mass market summer binge tourism with a bonus of uh, the world's most expensive and pointless ski jump. I don't know if anybody else watched. I didn't see all of the Olympics, but uh, the Olympic opening ceremony, but I found it quite inspiring and I thought it looked pretty amazing. It reminded me a little bit of the anti all, all of the, the, the downers that people had on China and, and even London, actually. It's really important what you've just mentioned, Niall, about even in London, because I had a couple of friends who were participating in help organising the opening ceremony. And this one friend of mine turned around to me once and said, you're the only political friend I've got who's excited <laughs> about the Games, rather than seeing it as negative, negative on East London, negative on goodness knows what. OK, we talk about Russian bashing, and I think there is that element, but I think it's also a dumbing down of expectations. And I think I would like to see more of the, wow, isn't this great? Oh, I don't like that ski jump, but I do like this bit. A celebration of, of something that happens only every four years, rather than looking for the negative in whatever we can see. Maybe we should look at some of the positives. Isn't that quite a simplistic view to have, though? Although I agree with that in, in the sense of, where not just Russia, kind of lots of countries that have kind of extreme poverty um, and issues that are much kind of more important than the Olympics can just to say, you know, they'll spend the, this is the most expensive Olympics ever. Um, is that really justifiable? It, it is development and it's development in the right way, it's bringing attention and no doubt anyone would say Sochi will be a better city after the Winter Olympics than it was before. I can almost guarantee that. Very few people have said uh, to any country, that it's, uh, to any city that's hosted the Olympics, it's a much worse place after the Olympics. There is that kind of quite strong aspect to anti-Olympic criticism, which is very much right. anti-development. I was just thinking about how your idea, Marissa, of, uh, of what we can do, and the, what I think is the real problem with uh, the, the slacktivists and the... Everyone is looking to the IOC, the Article 6, um, to politicians to do things. And coming back again to 1968 and the, the athletes, John Carlos and, and Tommy Smith and also Peter Norman, um, that was something they did as, as individuals but part of a political movement. It was, and, and they were actually ostracised and, and uh, you know, held back. Uh, they took some terrible flack from official them, from their governments, from the IOC, and it's it's such a contrast to 
um, what's being said today. You know, this idea that we have to look to the authorities to do things rather than to do things ourselves. And I think the reason um, 1968 had such power and, and Jesse Owens had such power, incidentally, Jesse Owens was used by the IOC to try and stop the 1968 Olympians from actually making their protest. They got him to go and talk to them to, 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 to try and get them to stop. But those things have so much power because they're ordinary people doing things. And actually, looking just briefly at, 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 at Russia, you know, people condemn Russians, you know, Russians uh, back in 1917, a long time ago, did some incredible things. They changed the history of the world, and, and for a while they had the, the most progressive society and the, the best laws on homosexuality and, and the way people live generally. I mean, it didn't turn out well, but you know, it shows that people can do things for themselves. You know, so let's not condemn ordinary Russians or, or ordinary people, I think, and have a bit more faith in them. I think it was interesting to see that well, to see that we didn't really see Tattoo performing in the opening ceremony. Um, I think their name stands for Girl on Girl Love or something like that in Russian. Um, and obviously they had their whole kind of like faux lesbian thing and the, the runaway schoolgirls. Um, and they were the kind of big opening act and they were holding hands and they were dressed like schoolgirls again. And yet it just kind of occupied a tiny little picture on news articles and all we really saw kind of on the headlines of the articles was the rings failing and the creepy bare faces. We just kind of saw what I guess we wanted to see was the, the failures of the opening ceremony. I think what's quite noticeable about the press coverage prior to the Olympics was that it was kind of this underlying kind of hoping that Russia fail. Yeah. They, they, they would rather see a bad Olympics even with kind of the Brendan O'Neill article in Spikes about how they're reacting towards uh, terrorist attacks, rather than kind of taking an objective view, there was this undertone of it, w it would be good to see something badly go wrong for Russia, which I think is kind of a very distasteful and kind of says a lot about us rather than saying something about Russia. Even when our journalists get there, the first thing they're doing is like checking if the toilet flushes, mm. and looking for faults in their rooms. I think it's irresponsible for a world leader to decide, you know, we're going to not go to the Olympics and then suddenly all these people who had hopes and dreams and had their parents driving them to the ice rink or whatever at six in the morning every weekend, you know, all that is gone. It's a mass, massive slap in the face to those people. I think in this day and age, we're, we're having celebrity chefs are supposed to have a political opinion on everything. You know, athletes are athletes. They don't necessarily have to have a political opinion on anything. So one of the reasons people are, are, are looking at, I've heard some of the arguments, was, well, isn't it about time athletes take a moral stand on things and think rather than themselves that they should get in there and, and boycott and, and be part of solidarity? And I think that's, I think that's absolutely wrong on so many mm. counts of what you've said in terms of what they're there for, what they're doing, and also the fact that it's short-termism. It doesn't work. It's never worked, and it won't work. People have to fight for their own rights, as we see, for example, in the suffragettes movement, civil rights. It was a bottom-up process rather than a top-down process. So I think we have to reinforce that point quite clearly here. Yeah, I would just say that I think uh, that the boycott, the kind of what I would characterise as a very vicious campaign, really, uh, against Russia, is really nothing to do with uh, Russia at all. And if we want to understand it, we really need to look at what's going on uh, at our political elites, our Western political elites, and why they are using these issues, coupled with a sort of real Western lovey, loving around sort of pussy riot, you know, this kind of real art school snobs that are pussy riot. Um, I think that the real effect it, ha it can only have is to just uh, alienate ordinary uh, Russians, really, in that respect. I think it would have the, um, uh, you know, a very negative effect. Hopefully, a bit like the London Olympics, where it was deemed everything was problematised before it happened, when it happened, it became a, 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 you know, a huge focus for celebration and inspiration. Nastavia! Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>